So as we continue in the book of Matthew this morning, I'll confess that I don't have all these messages all scheduled and planned out for the year at this point. I mean, I look, do look ahead some, but basically we're just going through it section by section here, the Gospel of Matthew, and trusting the Lord to lead us as to what to focus on as we do so. So it's kind of interesting to see what scripture we come to and what subject we're dealing with at certain points on the calendar. And I believe this scripture and message is especially appropriate for today because tonight is Oscar night. Now that doesn't mean much to me anymore. I usually don't watch the show these days and don't plan to tonight as a matter of fact. But if you're interested in it, the Academy Awards will be given to honor the work done in movies over the past year. And of course, one of the most coveted of those awards is the one for Best Picture. Which movie will get singled out by the Academy as being the cream of the crop, if you can refer to any of them that way? Uh, I usually haven't seen any of the ones that are nominated for that honor, so I'm not a good one to speculate. I'm not even sure I know which movies are up for the award tonight. I've, I've heard of a couple of them. I think Oppenheimer and Barbie, but that's about it. But it's a big deal for those involved to be able to lay claim to their movie being the one that won Best Picture for such and such a year. Because if the movie is still played in the theater, that distinction can give it a big boost as more people then decide to go and to check it out. Or when it comes out on streaming or DVD, if, if they're still coming out on DVD, I don't know, they can advertise that it was voted Best Picture, which is sure to make it sell better. It just means more notoriety and more money for that film. On their list of best movies of all time, the American Film Institute ranks Citizen Kane as number one. But Citizen Kane didn't win the Oscar for Best Picture that year. Instead, the award went to a movie called How Green Is My Valley. Now, how many of you rank that as one of your favorites? I wonder how many have ever heard of it. Now, I've heard of it. I don't think I've ever seen it, though. And it may be a good movie. But today, you know, it's not remembered or thought of as highly as some of the other movies from that same year. Not only Citizen Kane, but The Maltese Falcon with Humphrey Bogart in it. You know, many movies that have endured and have come to be considered classics are in some way movies that are better remembered by people, never won the award for Best Picture. Anybody know the movie The Wizard of Oz? It didn't win. Anybody heard of Star Wars? I'm talking about the first one. Not a Best Picture winner. North by Northwest, E.T., Psycho, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. None of them won the big award. And believe it or not, neither did It's a Wonderful Life, well, one of my favorites. So remember, remember that when you hear about which film wins Best Picture tonight. Now, those folks who were involved with that movie, they're going to celebrate like it's the greatest moment in their lives. But who knows? 20 or 30 years from now, that winning film might have faded into obscurity while people will still be watching some little-known movie from this year. You just never know. Well, as we continue to look at the Sermon on the Mount this morning, Let's think a little bit about this subject of awards or rewards is the word that it uses here, and it, they, they both kind of fit here, and that idea of getting recognition or credit for the things we do. Are we seeking to be the one who gets to go up on the big stage in front of our peers and before a huge TV audience with the music blaring and the people clapping and the camera zooming in on us? <clears throat> and everyone listening to our wonderful acceptance speech to be able to hold up the trophy and claim victory, to be able to put the title of best on whatever it is that we do because people recognize us and give us credit and praise for it, you know, whether it's at work or at home or even at church 
or in the community or on social media, you know, trying to get all those likes and those followers? Or are we more interested in a better and more enduring reward? One that will still matter 20 years from now and well into the future beyond that, even after we're no longer here on this earth. Do we primarily want man's recognition for being the best? Or do we mainly seek God's approval? Do we want man's award and applause or God's well done, good and faithful servant? Which is more important to us? Now, of course, we all like to be appreciated for what we do, and hopefully we will express such appreciation for one another. But are we striving mainly for that, for that thank you, for that credit, for that recognition from people, or are we primarily seeking for and willing to settle for God's smile of approval regardless of how anyone else responds? Well, Jesus had something to say about that in the next section of his Sermon on the Mount. So turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. And in verses 1 through 18 of this chapter, Jesus focuses on a group of people who did what they did to be seen and praised by other people. Although he doesn't name them by name, you know, Jesus was probably primarily thinking of the Pharisees. Uh, based on what he says of them and what we know of them elsewhere. You know, those religious leaders that he had just spoken to to the people about in connection with the subject of righteousness. Uh, When Jesus told the people that their righteousness needed to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, or they would not enter the kingdom of heaven. Although Jesus may have had those Pharisees in mind here, his description doesn't have to apply exclusively to them. There were other folks, other religious people who could have been just as guilty of these practices. So Jesus doesn't confine it to the Pharisees, and he actually uses another title, another word to describe these folks. This is what he calls them all the way through. It is a title he connects to the Pharisees later on when he's talking to them. But Jesus calls this type of people hypocrites. That's who he addresses here. He calls them hypocrites. And we get our English word hypocrite from the Greek word that's used here in the New Testament. But it was a word used to refer primarily to actors. So so remember that if you watch the Oscars tonight, that you'll be watching a room full of hypocrites, at least according to the original usage of the word. But it referred to the fact that the actors were just playing a role. They weren't being genuine. At the time, many of them wore masks, so it carried the idea of wearing a false face. They were being something they really weren't. They were putting on a show. Why? In order to please an audience, in order to receive the applause and the praise of people. And in some cases, maybe in order to get that Oscar, you know, the ultimate recognition. So as we talk about the hypocrites, Keep that definition in mind. Now, that word has come to have other connotations to it, but let's try to keep in mind what Jesus probably intended by it. Talking about someone who was putting on a show in order to receive the recognition and applause of other people. Well, what were these particular hypocrites doing whom Jesus made reference to? Well, let's read here. We'll read a few sections at a time as we go along here. Let's read first beginning at verse 1, Matthew 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. (coughs) 
So Jesus starts out talking here about charitable deeds. Now that could involve everything from giving an offering to helping someone who is in need. So Jesus said, don't have a trumpet sound like the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets when they do a charitable deed for someone. Now, some believe that Jesus was just using exaggeration here in order to make a point, that what he describes here you know, didn't really happen, not literally. You know, it wasn't what they really did. But Jesus was just using this extreme picture to illustrate his point. However, there are some others who believe that the Pharisees may have literally done this at times, that they would blow a trumpet or have someone blow a trumpet, maybe announcing that some offering was about to be given or some act of kindness was about to be done. So that the sounding of the trumpet was presumably, presumably to call the poor and the needy to come. It's like making an announcement, you know, there's, you know, there, there's help available. Come on and get help, you know, to let them know that, that that help was being offered. But it came to be a way for the givers to draw attention to themselves, to let everyone see that they were about to do this great deed and help out these poor souls. They wanted to be seen doing it. They wanted to be noticed because they wanted to receive recognition and praise from other people. So whether it was a, an actual practice of the time or just an exaggeration, you know, you, you get the point here. Because maybe you've run into some people like that. They may not blow a trumpet, but they make sure others know about whatever good deed they did. They make a big show of it. They let others know that they gave an offering and exactly how much it was that they gave. They always broadcast their acts of kindness toward others, maybe disguised in the form of a testimony or a prayer request, but still making sure everybody is aware of what they did, doing it not so that God will receive praise, but so that they will be looked up to and admired and received credit for being such a good Christian. Now, we all have to guard against more subtle forms of this kind of hypocrisy. When we do something to help someone, do we feel like we have to tell others about it? Do we feel like we need to get recognized or receive credit from other people? And I'm not suggesting that we always need to keep it a secret, but we do need to watch our motives in making it known. Is it for a testimony to God? or as a testimony to ourselves. Put yourself to the test on this. Try doing a kind deed and not letting anybody know about it. And then see if there's any kind of a struggle in your heart about not receiving any recognition for it. You know, that, that might tell us something about ourselves. Well, another thing the hypocrites did was related to prayer. Let's pick up there at verse 5 and read. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. So prayer, just like doing charitable deeds, it's a good thing. But how were these folks praying and why were they doing it? They loved to pray standing in the synagogues where everyone would see them and notice them. And they loved to pray standing on the street corners or even more people would notice them and their spirituality. You know, there were certain set times of the day when the Jews prayed. And some think these hypocrites would often make sure that at those set times that they just happened to be in a public place, like on a street corner. So then, you know, they would stop and pray and everyone could see and hear just how devout and godly they were. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I don't believe there's anything wrong with public prayer. I don't think that's what this is saying. But do we pray to be admired by people or to be heard by God? Do we use, you know, intentionally use the kind of flowery language that we hope will impress others? Or do we simply talk to our Heavenly Father? Are we being genuine when we pray? Or are we simply putting on a show to receive man's applause? Well, Jesus mentions a third practice, and that's found here in verses 16 through 18. Let's read those verses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Fasting. That practice of denying oneself food for a meal or for a set period of time or, or certain kinds of food. When the hypocrites fasted, they wanted others to know about it. So they went around with a sad look on their face. They wanted people to ask them what was wrong. So they could maybe respond something like, Oh, nothing. I'm just in the middle of a fast. And then maybe they'd let a little smile crack on their face as they walked away and heard that other person commenting, what a godly person he or she is. But these, these hypocrites in Jesus' day, they weren't satisfied with just looking sad. And again, unless Jesus was ag exaggerating their actions here, it seems that they actually tried to make themselves look bad or sickly in order to draw attention to themselves. In some way, they disfigured their faces to make themselves look that way. You know, Ash Wednesday was celebrated here a few weeks ago. And it, of course, marks the beginning of Lent, a season of self-denial that some Christian traditions observe. You know, and some put or have someone put ashes on their forehead in the form of a cross as part of their observance there on Ash Wednesday. Now, I don't typically do that. But it, I can see that it could be a good reminder, and it's meaningful to some people. But I can imagine folks similar to those Jesus was referring to, wanting others to notice the ash marks on their forehead or their face, showing their devout repentance or their commitment to deny themselves something during this season of the year. You now, these hypocrites Jesus referred to, you know, if they were involved in that, they probably would have refrained from washing their faces as long as possible so that, so that those ash marks would remain there for others to see and admire. Fasting is good. You know, we don't practice enough of it. We don't practice it enough in our day. You know, self-denial is good, and not just during Lent, but throughout the year. But we need to guard against that desire for recognition, that that longing, wanting, deep desire to let others know that we're doing those things and seeking their applause and their praise for it. And that's really what all of this comes down to. That's the, the heart of the message that Jesus has for us on this subject of, of awards and recognition and rewards. What does Jesus recommend about charitable giving? He said, do it in secret that your Father who sees it will reward you. What does he say about prayer? Pray privately. Close the door so it's just you and God, and God who sees the secret things will reward you. And what does he say about fasting? What does he recommend about it? He says, wash your face. Try to look good and fresh and happy. Don't make it look like you're fasting. Fast to your Father and he will reward you. The main point here isn't whether other people find out about it or not. The main thing is our motives and our aim. Are we being genuine when we help people, doing it out of love and concern, or are we just doing it for show? Are we really praying to God, to God, 
Or are we just saying the words we think people expect to hear and that will impress them? Are we genuinely fasting or, or worshiping or whatever else it may be? Or are we just putting on the appearance of doing so? And the related question, a very important one. Are we doing these things to please and impress people? Or are we doing them to please and honor God? Is it for our glory? Or is it for His glory? And the answer to those questions make a huge difference, don't they? If we're doing those things to please people, we will probably receive a reward of some kind. We might get a pat on the back. We might get somebody's look of approval. We might get some applause. We might even get an Oscar for being the best charitable giver or the best prayer or the best in fasting. But you know, that's as far as our reward will go. That's all the reward we will get. But if we'll do those things for God, if we'll do those things for Him and do them whether other people notice and recognize us or not, if we'll do them out of love for God and in order to honor Him and doing it looking only for His approval, then we will receive a reward that will mean so much more and that will last much longer than any recognition we might get from other people now. An Oscar for being the best is nice. But in the long run, it really doesn't mean a lot. Other people's approval, it can be encouraging and affirming, but it's not the main thing. What matters is to receive God's well done. That's what we should aim for. And if we've got that, that's really all that should matter to us.